Okay, gentlemen, this is Mr. Bourne here, and I'm just going to go through this presentation, which is on the syllabus dot point 9.62, which is dealing with food preservation techniques that began with the simple procedures and complex substances and developed to include a wider range of chemical substances and principles. This is um, quite an interesting dot point because basically we look at the, the types of additives and preservatives that are used today and the reasons for their use. A little bit of background information before we start there. As you can see, tech, these techniques have been used for thousands of years. The early stages of pickling with vinegar, drying and salting, there's evidence that this was used 5,000 to 10,000 years ago. 5,000 years ago in Mesopotamia and certain parts of Africa for about 10,000 years ago. So this, this idea of preserving food is not a new thing. Okay, so we're going to be looking at this particular dot point here, 9.6.211, and it's to distinguish between physical and chemical means of food preservation. Okay, so it's very important that we understand and distinguish between whether it's physical or chemical food preservation. That's very important. So let's, let's touch upon the physical, physical properties here. So when a physical change occurs, there is no new substance that is produced and no chemical reaction occurs. There may be a change in colour, but that's about it. So examples may include pasteurisation, heating, freezing, drying, canning, ultraviolet or high intensity white light and vacuum packaging. So if we're looking at this area here of this content, you really want to make sure you write notes that are highlighted in this bold part here. Okay, so you can stop and pause any moment and take notes, but don't write everything down here. You're trying to make skinny notes when completing this task. Okay, let's compare this to chemical preservation techniques. So when we say chemical, it means preserving usually by adding a chemical. Right, these chemicals either inhibit the activity of bacteria or they outright kill them, therefore enabling the food to last a lot longer. Okay, and some of these include benzoates, nitrites, and sulfites. Okay, moving on to the next dot point in 962, we're looking at the one that specifically rates, relates to the types of um, physical preservation techniques. And we'll be focusing on canning, freezing and refrigeration, drying, boiling, irradiation, pickling, salting and vacuum packaging. All right, so with canning, this involves boiling the food first, okay, and then sealing the can airtight, preventing any bacteria from entering. This sterilizes the food so it can be kept for a very long period of time. However, once you open that can, you really do need to refrigerate it, and this only lasts for a short period of time before spoilage occurs. One of the problems with using canning as a technique is that when you boil the food, it can generally change its taste and texture from its original state. Okay, and you can look at often these tinned, tinned foods, tinned vegetables, tinned fruit, where because of the nature of the preservation technique of boiling it before canning it, it changes the texture of it, okay? So let's move on to freezing and refrigeration. Freezing does not destroy the spoilage organism, so that's a bacteria and fungi, but it slows it down, okay? Any bacteria present will become, become active as the food thaws out. So if it's under minus 18 degrees, it, it tends to be okay, minus, minus 18. It tends to, to, to slow down the spoilage, doesn't stop it, okay? And bacterial growth tends to occur when it starts to thaw out. So this is very important that you consume food quickly when thawing out. So freezing does not kill all the microorganisms in the food, but it can kill up to 80% of them. Meanwhile, refrigeration will slow down the growth of bacteria and fungi, but it doesn't stop it completely as freezing does. Okay, 
Hence, refrigeration only keeps food for days rather than months that freezing does. So the effectiveness of, of, of a refrigerator, whether it's brand new or whether the quality of it, will, will actually uh, affect the, um, the effectiveness of the shelf life of these foods. There are some, some issues when, uh, when, when using uh, um, frozen foods. Some physical changes do occur. So we'll look at the original structure. It is damaged. Okay. What you'll see is that the, the, the size of the cells, the crystals form, water crystals form in these cells, they expand and they damage the internal structure of that particular food product. Okay. When you thaw it, there's noticeable moisture loss as well. And depending on how long you actually keep the food in the fridge will also increase the, the, the size of the water crystals and therefore the damage to the food. So we're looking now at drying and dehydration. Drying kills or completely inactivates most bacteria. So what we're occurring here is we're removing the water from these particular food substances. Now dehydration to a lesser extent than drying aims to eliminate as much water as possible so that microorganisms are unable to grow. This process of removing water is very effective in reducing bacterial growth because remember microorganisms they need water and heat in order to reproduce and to become in dangerous colonies. Okay. Continuing on here, most bacteria die or become completely inactive when they are dehydrated as I said earlier. Bacteria need water to reproduce so you remove that they die off. Normally drying completely alters the taste and the texture of the food, um, but not always. So in some cases such as raisins or sometimes it actually enhances it. Now another form of drying is what we call freeze drying. And it's a special form of drying that removes all moisture and tends to have a less of an effect on the food's taste than say normal dehydration. And you can see this often in, in, um, in, in instant coffee where they freeze dry to snap the taste and then export, export it around the world. And it's just an example of, of a food dryer <coughs> that we've uh, used in the lab. I think these look like apricots or something like that, or plums. Right, so now we move on to this, this idea of boiling, and this can include the heating or pasteurization. So when you heat a substance over 70 degrees of pasteurization, it will generally kill the bacteria, right? When you increase it to 120, that's using ultra-high temperature, so UHT, this will kill all spores as well. All right? Food is generally canned after heating. And this, can, this, this then has an enormous impact in that the food can actually be stored for many, many months and even years. Again, one of the problems of boiling food is you generally change its taste and texture. So this does, from a marketing point of view, affect sales because people are buying a product because they want to, to have it as near to the original um, characteristics of that particular product or food. Now radiation. This is, uh, this is able to kill the bacteria without significantly changing the food. Okay, So if you seal the food in plastic and then radiate it, the food will become sterile and it can be stored on the shelf without refrigeration. Okay, and it's one of the few foods that doesn't tend to alter its, um, its taste. But some can become darker and a bit mushy as well, say in some of the meats, so dark, uh, the actual red meat become a little bit darker and your fish can become a little bit mushy. So moving on to pickling. Um, pickling has been used for many, many, many thousands of years. And it's essentially the technique where you preserve the food by using salt and acid. And this acidic environment really does inhibit bacteria. Okay? But with pickling, you need to make sure your jars are absolutely clean. Otherwise, if you do not make sure that there's no bacteria in there by boiling the, the inside of the, of the jars and the lids, you will end up creating this particular product that has all the bacteria in it. 
but pickling has been used for many, many years in, to, to make sure that fruits or vegetables are able to be used and consumed all year round and out of season. Just a little picky of some, some of these pickled produce. Okay, here we get to salting, and salting again has been used for thousands of years for many different cultures, where essentially you apply salt to that particular product, mainly meats, in order to draw out the moisture. Okay, so when you're looking at this large content or large passage of writing here, I wouldn't be writing all this down, that's crazy. What you want to do is you want to look at key points here, salting. What is it doing here? So you've got the salt draws out the moisture and creates an environment that is inhospitable to bacteria. So inhospitable meaning that they're not going to live there and reproduce and grow. Okay? So salting has been used for many, many years. And here's a picture of just uh, a leg of ham that's been generously salted. All right? It'll be stored in a cool, dry area. Okay, and the salt will draw out the moisture in that leg of leg of uh, pig there, and it'll become one form or another of this nice dried meats. Okay, back in packaging, I'll just move on to the next slide so it actually demonstrates it. So if you look here, you've got a whole bunch of garlic cloves and some form of soup or another where this device it sucks out the air it seals this plastic um, sleeve here and it becomes airtight I'll just return to the slide again so when this by removing the air seal tight it removes the oxygen that would otherwise support organisms that attack food such as fungi bacteria and insects etc so removing the oxygen reduces the spoilage of the food. So we seem to be recurring here. Reduce the temperature, because bacteria love a, a warm environment. Microbes, bacteria, they require water and oxygen. So heat, water, and oxygen. Re you remove them, and you remove or reduce the spoilage um, properties. Okay, almost finished here. We're now relating the chemical uh, food preservation to the use of chemicals that, that kill microorganisms through the use of nitrates, nitrites, and sulfites. So, what are chemical preservatives? They're food additives that prevent the, t the deterioration or decomposition of food. Yeah. So factors that influence the effectiveness can be the concentration of the chemicals that are used, the type and number of microorganisms present, the temperature at which food is stored, how long food is stored, so that's a time, and the characteristics of the food. So if we just look here, highlight the words sodium nitrite and nitrates, nitrites rather. Okay, so nit the sodium nitrate is used in curing um, meats. So they are curing salts. Okay, And nitrites are typically used in preference to nitrates because they, they accomplish it a lot quicker. Yep. So the reaction it takes less time for the, for the, for the actual salts to, to cure the meat than it does a nitrate. Okay, And these are used because they help achieve um, or prevent the growth of such bacteria as Clostridium botulinum, which is the disease botulism. Okay, and if you look down on here, these sulfites include sulfur dioxide and, and sodium or potassium metas bisulfite. They prevent discolorization of foods such as dried food, a dry fruit rather, um, frozen potatoes, and seafood. Okay. Now looking at the specific design of some of these particular preservatives additives for the desired effect of increased shelf life, the texture of a product, the appearance and the flavor, and just, just talking about some of the nuances of these additives that are used, okay? 
because we're finding more and more uh, uh, issues with the preservatives and additives that are added to our foods, um, all due to the, the marketing of it, what it looks like, what it tastes like, and what it feels like. Okay. So, these chemicals make food last longer on the shelf, which is what we want, as well as in your refrigerator. And they do this by inhibiting the growth of organisms, such as bacteria or fungi. Okay, that's what shelf life's about. Keeping something on the, pro on, the, on the market, on the shopping shelves, so people can buy it longer. So you have food for longer periods of time. Okay, some are antioxidants. That means that they retard the oxidization. So that's react reacting with oxygen of fats and oils. And the oxidize, oxidization leads to the food becoming rancid and losing color. Okay. So some of these particular uh, additives are used to prevent that from happening, so making, making it, uh, particularly meats, stop going rancid. Most of these preservatives have no adverse side effects, but there is some evidence that is coming out uh, that some of these additives can cause cancer. Okay, But like with any of these scientific studies, there's also a counterclaim by very, very uh, powerful companies that... Um, obviously trying to protect their, their, their uh, products. All right, so most of these additives are designed to improve the texture of food, okay? So the texture is when you put it into your mouth, what does it feel like? Or when you're holding it in your hands, or when you're consuming it, or when you're applying it to your body, what does it feel like or taste like? And Basically, they're, a lot of them are made from carbohydrates that thicken the food by absorbing some of the naturally occurring water. Yep. Now, again, these additives don't have any adverse side effects, but there's more and more research into um, the potential risks of overconsumption of these type of foods. So we move on to appearance, and this is where we start to see some major issues with the artificial uh, colorings that have, have come into the market and the, and the huge side effects in terms of hyperactivity and potential cancers in, um, in, in, in people who are consuming them. Again, there's a lot of controversy because there's always counterclaims in, in the research of this. So, um, so as, as it says in there in the text here, that we have many colorings that actually cause hyperactivity and you probably know as you're growing up, the commonly one is about red cordial, well, yes. So if you start to see down here, we have artificial colouring such as red 40, yellow 5. These cause mild um, allergic reactions in some people, including asthma attacks and a rash and rashes in children. There's also other links to thyroid tumours, chromosomal damage, hives and hyperactivity. Again, these are artificial colourings that have been added to particular products to make them really stand out in their particular colour. Okay. So, just like in, in, in appearance, we start to have these additives that are, that are put into products for their flavor, okay? So, you know, you have examples of anything, really, from, you know, grape, color, grape flavored bubble gum. There's not actually little grapes in there. They're, they're these chemicals, these artificial sweeteners and esters that are, that are, that are manufactured to, to help taste of that particular product. So many of these additives are artificial sweeteners, and some enhance the natural flavors of the food. So we'll, we'll stick out with three main ones here, okay? So hopefully I can pronounce it right. We've got acusulfane K and aspartame, which, which most of you are quite familiar with because it's in Coke Zero and you know a Diet Coke and such as Equal, uh, these no sugar type um, substitutes, as well as um, monosodium glutamate, which, which commonly is MSG. So let's look at acusulfame K. It's an artificial sweetener that is used in chewing gums and soft drinks, and there's, there's been quite a bit of testing um, about whether it causes cancer or not, but the verdict's still out there. Again, same with aspartame. It's an artificial sweetener. It has very, very low calories, and it's to zero calories almost, and it's used in diet food products. Right, there's some people that have experienced dizziness or headaches after drinking such, such soft drinks or foods, and there's, there's some links 
to um, cancers, but the evidence is still uh, are lacking there. Now, MSG has been around for a while, and there's been you know a lot of controversy with it, and it's basically a flavor enhancer. But as studies have shown that some people are very sensitive to MSG with reactions such as headaches, nausea, difficulty breathing, and changes in heart rate. Okay, guys, that's that's enough for me at the moment. What I've given you is a basic verbal summary on top of a uh, PowerPoint slide. So I want you to be able to make skinny notes out of these, these PowerPoints. Don't write word for word. You have a lot of resources there, so make sure your notes are succinct, but they're very clear and they flow. And that way you'll be able to um, really get some good notes for your upcoming assessments. Okay, thank you.